Hello, everyone, and welcome to the New York Combinatoric Seminar. This is our 11th year, I think, and it was started by Janusz Park. So we're really delighted to have Janusz give us a talk. Janusz is from um, Rennie Institute in Budapest and EPFL Lausanne, and also from CUNY. The floor is yours. Thank you, Janusz. So thanks, Sandra, for the introduction. And we discussed that this is a picture of the uh, Graduate Center. And I vividly remember, this is the second picture, let me show you. Uh, when I first uh, spoke in uh, this seminar uh, many years ago, then I knew that, I mean, it was uh, opposite to the uh, New York Public Library and uh, on 42nd Street. And uh, I went there and I got there uh, somehow half an hour earlier. So I thought that I would walk around a little bit in the park. But I recognized the building uh, and I thought, what a wonderful building, only in New York. And also I thought that it was a, a beautiful uh, abbreviation for the graduate center that grace. And uh, so I, I, I waited until five minutes before the lecture started and I entered the building. Uh, and only then I discovered that I was in the wrong building. Uh, the Grace building, uh, is, it was the building of the Grace uh, Chemical Company. Of course, I, had, I hadn't heard of it uh, before. And uh, I started panicking and uh, found that the Graduate Center building is actually next to it. Here, here it is an old uh, picture of it. Uh, it's an 18 floor building. Uh, this is from 1913 uh, when it was being built. And the, the Grace building uh, is at the place of this, uh, this other building uh, next to it. So anyway, uh, shortly after that, uh, the uh, we moved to the uh, uh, to the Altman building. But still, I'd like to show you this uh, beautiful picture because uh, the Graduate Center still had some relationship uh, with uh, with the Grace family or Grace building. I don't know. I think that one of the Graces was actually, if I remember well was the mayor of New York City. And uh, maybe because of that, or for some other reason, uh, the Graces allowed the uh, uh, Graduate Center board meetings to be had on the top floor uh, of the Grace Building. And uh, after the seminars at night, we could kind of, uh, walk to the Grace building, uh, to, this, uh, to this beautiful room, uh, room at the top and look down uh, at uh, the public library. And it's a, it was really a fantastic view. You saw roughly what you see from here. Uh, this is the Grace building that you see at the bottom uh, of the picture and uh, I mean, at that time, I don't think that there were too many places on earth where you saw all these skyscrapers uh, and all of the, you, you could look down at them. The beautiful view. Okay, so uh, let me start with uh, my topic. Uh, so enumeration of intersection graphs. Uh, first of all, I'd like to tell you what uh, an intersection graph is. So here you see a system of segments and we can associate with it a graph so that we assign to each segment a vertex of the graph and the two vertices are connected by an edge if and only if the corresponding two segments intersect. Like one and two, are connected by an edge because segment number one and segment number two uh, have a point in common. And if you look at two and three, two and three are not connected by an edge because the segments two and three 
uh, don't cross each other. And obviously, uh, in this way, you can build uh, an intersection graph for any kind of uh, geometric or, as a matter of fact, any kind of abstract objects. So let me start with an early result, uh, geometric result, uh, that um, I proved uh, with József uh, Sojmosi more than 20 years ago. So uh, we counted the number of uh, segment intersection graphs, the number of graphs that can be obtained uh, as uh, intersection graphs of, of segments in, uh, uh, in the plane. And we got that the number of such labeled uh, graphs is two to the constant times n log n. And we even uh, gave an upper bound two to the roughly four times n log n. Of course, it's a big number, but, uh, but it is much, much, much smaller than the total number of labeled graphs on n vertices, which is, which is two to the n choose two. Each of the n choose two edges is either there or not there. So these are two to the n choose two choices. Now, uh, it turned out uh, that uh, this bound is, uh, asymptotically tight in the sense that this uh, constant four, even this constant four uh, is best possible. Uh, this was um, uh, uh, discovered shortly after by, by Jacob Fox. And then last year, uh, a paper of Lisa Sauerman uh, appeared, a beautiful paper which uh, maybe I will say a couple of words about, but, but the, the um, essence of it is that uh, there is a large class of uh, graphs, uh, large class of um, or, or geometric objects, or if you wish, or classes of graphs, intersection graphs for which, uh, uh, one can even determine this constant. So, uh, so Lisa uh, generalized the statement to a large extent, and it's a beautiful, uh, deep paper uh, she wrote, which is uh, worth reading. Now, uh, here is a picture of uh, Josef Shoy in 2001 but uh, I think that doing the this year. Now, uh, let me uh, look at a very similar question where the answer turned out to be completely different. So what happens if instead of segments, we consider strings, we consider uh, continuous arcs uh, in the plane? So how many intersection graphs are there uh, of uh, strings in the plane? So the only difference is that the definition is the same. We, get, we have a bunch of strings in the plane, uh, a bunch of arcs. Two of them can intersect in a arbitrary number of uh, points. And again, to each string, we assign a vertex. And uh, two of them we connect if and only if the strings intersect. So around the same time, uh, Giza Tote and myself found that uh, uh, the answer is almost as large uh, as uh, the total number of uh, labeled graphs. This means that the exponent of the two is, is almost n choose two, actually three quarters times n choose two. Uh, and uh, we also proved the ramification uh, of uh, this uh, uh, theorem. So if we only considered uh, intersection graphs of strings, any two of which intersect in at most D points where, the, where, where D is a fixed, uh, uh, fixed constant, like in at most 10, uh, 10 points, then the answer changes. And instead of two to the a quadratic uh, exponent, the total number of intersection graphs 
becomes 2 to the little o of n squared. So uh, it, let me show this uh, uh, table, which where you see that that uh, uh, certain entries uh, are blurred. They are intentionally blurred. So what we have seen uh, so far is that uh, intersection graphs of segments, their number is two to the L log n, then uh, intersection graphs of uh, at most uh, the intersecting strings is two to the little o of n square, but we don't know what the little o is. And the to total number of intersection graphs of uh, strings is two to the three quarters uh, times n choose two, but we can ask the same question for all kinds of other things, inter intersection graphs of disks or unit disks or convex sets, and uh, whatever I will be uh, uh, talking about in this uh, talk, it, it will always be in the plane. Uh, so I, I look at two dimensional object. Well, it's not completely true, but but uh, uh, I will actually mention when I say anything about higher dimensions. So uh, this is the uh, so for me ask that uh, what's going on here? Uh, why is it that in certain cases uh, uh, the answer is uh, uh, two to the n log n. In some cases, uh, the answer is much bigger, and uh, I'd like to. I I, I won't uh, give exact details, but I'd like to indicate uh, uh, indicate the reason. So uh, let's go back to the uh, to the uh, Shoimoshi paper. Uh, so the number of segment intersection graphs is uh, roughly uh, two to the n log n and four n log n and uh, this one is asymptotic every time. So first I'd like to show you uh, the uh, construction of uh, Jacob Fox uh, that shows that, uh, that this uh, two to the four n log n is essentially tight. In fact, the construction will be a bipartite construction. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, I will have two kinds of segments, uh, long segments or full lines. It doesn't make any difference whether they are just very, very long segments or full lines. I assume that we, we have this green uh, full lines, epsilon n of them, and the remaining segments, uh, uh, one minus epsilon times n segments, they are the blue segments. And uh, what uh, I like to uh, uh, show is that uh, there are, um, well, uh, at least roughly uh, two to the four n log n bipartite intersection patterns uh, uh, between uh, uh, green, the green lines and the blue segments. So the total number of uh, green blue intersection graphs is uh, is at least uh, two to the four n log n. Okay, so I look at these uh, epsilon n uh, green lines. They divide the plane into roughly this many cells, one half times uh, epsilon n squared cells. And then if I look at the blue segment, then a blue segment uh, has two endpoints. One of them uh, in one cell, the other one in another cell. And the location of the endpoints of the blue segments will completely determine that which green lines are intersected uh, by these uh, blue segments. So, well, uh, out of the uh, one half epsilon n square cells, I can choose uh, 
two cells for the endpoints of a blue segment in one half epsilon n squared choose two uh, different ways. And uh, each of these choices will uh, represent a, an intersection pattern between the blue segments and the green lines. So the number of uh, intersection graphs, number of intersection patterns uh, between the uh, lines and the segments is well, uh, one half epsilon n squared choose two. And for each of the segments, I have a choice. This is the exponent. If you compute it, this is roughly two to the four n log n. So, so, so this is the construction that that um, uh, May I ask shows. A question? Sorry. May I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Why is it obvious that different choices produce different graphs? Well, they they don't uh, they they uh, represent different bipartite intersection patterns because the location of a point. If you have the location of the two points, then you know that uh, which green lines uh, those two cells are separated by. So I just, what, what I'm just, what I'm claiming is just that if you know the, uh, the location of the endpoints of the blue segments, then you know that which green lines will be intersected by this segment. Of course, the intersection pattern between the blue segments uh, can be different, but but this is a lower estimate. This is just a lower bound. Thank you. I think I forgot that this is a labeled graph. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then it's that was um, on the first. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Boris. <laughs> okay. So, so, so now I'd like to indicate uh, very quickly where this two to the n log n. Forget about the constant. Where the this n log n comes from. Uh, okay, so it's uh, it. Uh, uh, so let's look at segment intersection graphs. So we have n segments, and each of those segments uh, uh, SI can be described uh, by essentially by four constants. Uh, AI, BI, CI, and DI. So the first thing is the equation of the line that supports the segment. This is Y equals AIX plus BI. This is the equation of segment number I. But that's the equation of the line. And then you have to tell that which part of that line is the segment. So you have to uh, say that, well, this is X is between CI and DI. So these four numbers, they completely determine uh, the segments. Now, if you have a pair of segments, SI and SJ, then it is very easy to determine uh, whether the two segments uh, intersect each other. This is uh, kind of uh, high school uh, uh, analytical geometry. Uh, you can compute it, the SI co crosses SJ if uh, those uh, eight numbers, AI, BI, CI, DI, and AJ, BJ, CJ, and DJ, they satisfy uh, these, two these two inequalities. Actually, this is four inequalities because the uh, BJ minus BI divided by uh, AI minus AJ must be bigger both than both CI and bigger than CJ and smaller than DI and DJ. Okay. So, so if you know these uh, constants, then you know the intersection pattern. And now uh, comes this theorem, which is usually referred to uh, in the literature as the Milner Tom uh, theorem, but Actually, in the Russian literature, it was uh, discovered uh, much earlier by Olenik and Petrovsky, uh, which is a very uh, uh, curious and very useful theorem. So 
what the CRM says is the following. Uh, this is a simple statement in uh, uh, real algebraic geometry, and uh, its its proof is not particularly complicated. So what what does the CRM say? Consider M polynomials, M like Mary. Uh, each of uh, those uh, polynomials has has. Uh, uh, I mean, the uh, polynomials have k variables, and the degree of the polynomials is uh, at most d. At most d. Now, uh, what we'd like to get, uh, we would like to estimate, is the number of possible sign patterns of these polynomials. So, what does it mean that the number of sign patterns? Well, we take those m polynomials. And we substitute uh, real values in the place of the variables. So let's, uh, in one substitution, we look at the first polynomial. The first polynomial can be positive, negative, or zero. The second polynomial can be positive, negative, or zero. Third polynomial can be positive, negative, and zero. So uh, uh, if I look at uh, uh, this this pattern like positive, positive, negative, zero, and so on. There are three to the n possibilities, and uh, I substitute uh, real values in place of the variables in all possible ways, and I count that how many different sequences I get. So the total number of uh, different sequences is, is uh, at most uh, three to the n because uh, each of those polynomials is po can be positive, negative, or or zero. But what uh, Milnor, Tom, Barr, and Olenik, Petrovsky, uh, and so on discovered that actually, uh, if the if d and k, the degree and the number of variables is constant. Then out of these exponentially many three to the m possibilities, only a, a polynomial number, only roughly m to the k, can be realized. So, uh, so we apply it uh, to our case, and we look at the intersection uh, intersection patterns of, of segments. Then the the uh, number of uh, so each of those numbers, a, i, b, i, c, i, d, i, uh, is a variable. So there are n segments. So it's uh, there are four n variables. Uh, the number of inequalities uh, uh, is well for each pair, s, i, s, g, i, n, two or four whatever inequalities. Uh, two times n choose two inequalities and. Uh, the equations, if I multiply both sides by ei minus h, I, they are quadratic. And if you apply uh, the theorem that you get the, the number of intersection patterns uh, of uh, the segments is at most, you do the computation, is at most two to the L of n. So this is roughly the idea. There are, of course, uh, uh, some small details here. That now, it turns out that uh, this approach, uh, this uh, using the milnor palm uh, uh, theorem, this works not only for segment intersection graphs, but for any kind of uh, intersection graphs of uh, things that can be described by uh, polynomial inequalities. Uh, intersection graphs, of the, the, these are called semi-algebraic sets. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, Lisa Zauerman's paper is uh, a finer, says something about the finer structure of this proof, uh, where one can even uh, determine the constant in this uh, uh, big O L log N uh, exponent in certain mm -hmm. cases. Uh, depending on the families of semi-algebraic sets that, that we consider. Okay. So 
now I'd like to indicate uh, uh, very quickly that um, why is the situation different uh, if instead of segments, we look at strings. So string intersection graphs, arcs. So here is a very simple construction. I have n strings, and half of them are these uh, uh, bluish, greenish strings. You know, each of them is a circle. I removed here a point so that they are not uh, closed strings, but open ones. But each of those strings, they are like uh, concentric circles, but they stick out. Each of them sticks out at some point and has an exposed uh, uh, point uh, somewhere outside. And then I have n half uh, uh, sort of purple uh, similar curves. And uh, we notice that each of those purple curves uh, can actually intersect uh, and so, so we can decide freely that you'd like which uh, uh, kind of bluish curves you'd like to intersect by a purple curve. So, if you want to intersect uh, only the first curve and the last curve, only the black one and the green one, then we sort of have a circle which goes out here at the first one, first place, and uh, goes out again uh, to the sticking point of the green one, and then it continues. So this means that there are n half times n half, this means n squared divided by four pairs of green uh, purple curves. And um, for uh, each of those pairs, I can freely decide whether I'd like to like them to cross or not to cross. So the number of bipartite intersection patterns between these two sets of curves is two to the n squared divided by four. Actually, we can do a little bit better because uh, uh, we can divide uh, the curves into four groups, n divided by four, n divided by four, n divided by four, n divided by four. And between any two of those groups, uh, we can freely determine the intersection pattern. And then it turns out this is four choose two times uh, and divided by four squared. This is uh, roughly two to three quarter times n squared divided by two. So the number of string graphs on n vertices is at least this big. So how do we know that uh, this uh, construction is uh, uh, kind of asymptotically best uh, possible. Here I have to uh, refer, uh, and again, I, I will only indicate it. I definitely don't want to go into the uh, details with that. Uh, so what is the basic uh, question of extremal graph theory? Is this somewhat uh, a natural notation? Uh, x and age is a function. So these are the maximum number of edges uh, that a graph of m vertices can have if it doesn't contain age as a subgraph. So uh, age is a fixed graph, like uh, cycle of length four, for instance. The question is that, that how many edges can such a graph have? And uh, uh, we denote by forb for for forbidden the number of uh, uh, n vertex graphs in which age like c four for instance cycle of x four is is forbidden. Uh, so there is a there is another uh, important parameter uh, of graphs. We you know the chromatic number of a graph, and it turns out that this question, the basic question, which is also called Turan type question, extremal graph theory, can asymptotically it can be answered. Answered. It can be answered by the Erdős Stone Shimonovich theorem, which uh, which uh, says that uh, the the maximum number of edges that an age-free 
uh, graph can have is constant times n squared plus little of n squared, where the constant is one uh, minus one over the chromatic number minus one. And uh, the somewhat surprising beautiful theorem, which was proved in uh, uh, 1986, is the erdős frankl rödel theorem, uh, which uh, says that uh, the total number of H-free graphs is uh, two to the exactly this extremal number. The extremal number comes from a uh, partite construction. And what this theorem essentially says is that uh, the vast majority of uh, H-free graphs can be obtained in this way. Now, there is a, a kind of parallel theory uh, for uh, uh, the very similar problem, which, which, which still technically looks different. When uh, in the Turan type question, what we exclude is age, this, this subgraph age, as a subgraph, not as an induced subgraph. So if we only exclude induced subgraphs, then uh, the question obviously changes. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there is a very similar theory for that. Uh, I, I uh, put uh, up this uh, slide to indicate it, uh, but already if you look at it, it is clear that, that uh, uh, this uh, extreme number, the maximum number of edges that a uh, graph of m vertices can, can have that doesn't contain edges and induced subgraph. This is a silly question because uh, if you take, if you look at the complete graph, then all of its induced subgraphs will be complete. Uh, nevertheless, we can properly define this uh, this uh, function. Uh, x star and h, I will uh, indicate how, so that uh, we can estimate the number of uh, uh, graphs and vertices that do not contain h as an induced subgraph. And it turns out that the characterization is almost the same as for normal subgraphs. There is a slight difference that we will have uh, instead of the chromatic number, we have, a, we, we, we have another parameter which is closely related to that, but it's kind of a little bit finer. And uh, uh, for this, we have to define what it means uh, that a graph H is RS colorable. So it RS colorable, it means that we can it's, it's kind of a refinement of the chromatic number so that we can color the vertices of the graph by R colors so that out of those uh, R color classes, S color classes are complete and the other color classes uh, are empty, are independent sets. So in the chromatic number, all of the color classes should be independent sets. Here we allow S color classes uh, that are not independent, but the opposite of it, complete. And then the parameter that, uh, that we have to define uh, is uh, uh, this, uh, instead of the chromatic number, is this tau of H, this is the smallest integer R so that uh, this graph H is R as colorable for all uh, values S that are uh, smaller than R. So for instance, this fancy chromatic number of a cycle of lengths four is three. The normal chromatic number of a cycle of lengths uh, two is, cycle of lengths four is two. It's a bipartite graph. But, uh, but, um, this fancy chromatic number is, uh, is uh, three. So here is, for instance, a three zero coloring. 
you we have um, uh, a coloring of the vertices by three colors so that each of the color classes is an independent set there are zero com complete subgraphs the red they they are an independent set the blue is one vertex it's an independent set the green is one vertex an independent set here is a three one coloring of the same graph again coloring with three colors so that one of those color classes the red one is a complete subgraph the others are independent and so on for each of them so and it turns out that that now if we define in a similar way as before uh, this funny function x star and age as one minus one over tau age minus one times n squared divided uh, by two plus the flow of n squared. So the same as before uh, in the Turan type uh, problem, except that instead of the chromatic number here, we have this tau, then it will be true that the total number of uh, graphs on n vertices, labeled graphs, <coughs> uh, which uh, do not contain age as an induced subgraph uh, is roughly two to the this function. So this is the uh, Prömer Steger theorem, which was uh, uh, generalized by Bolobash and Thomason uh, for any kind of heretic graph classes hereditary properties this means that not only for those uh, uh, graphs that do not contain uh, an induced uh, fixed induced subgraph but for instance for uh, uh, the class of graphs that are intersection graphs of streaks that's a hereditary property if if uh, uh, certain uh, if a graph is an intersection graph of strings then if i look at an induced subgraph of it that it's also an intersection graph of strings that's the definition of hereditary property and in the background of this uh, prömer steger bolobash thomason theorem is summary this regularity lemma so this is the this is the tool uh, that uh, uh, we are using and um, in order to uh, deal with the case uh, of um, when we want to count the number of intersection uh, string intersection graphs then we just have to find uh, a good uh, forbidden induced subgraph for which that parameter tau is five and here is the graph i don't want to explain it why it is but then if it is uh, if, if tau is five then here you get uh, one minus one over four times n squared divided by two and that's where uh, our estimate uh, comes from so so here is uh, Giza Toad's picture uh, sitting in my uh, office at NYU uh, nearly 20, uh, 20 years ago. Okay, so um, so we have seen now uh, intersection graphs of segments. Two to the n log n is the uh, the number. Intersection graphs of strings. Uh, two to the uh, quadratic uh, amount. And uh, I'd like to say uh, just a couple of words about uh, um, uh, uh, generalization of it. So if you look at intersection graphs of convex sets, now obviously, uh, or I can say intersection graphs of convex curves, that's, uh, that this is exactly the same. So if I look at intersection graphs of strings or intersection graphs of convex strings, clearly uh, uh, the convex strings, this is a subset of the intersection graphs of, 
of things. So, uh, but uh, it turns out uh, that uh, actually uh, the intersection uh, we have the we we have a very similar construction to the construction I showed you with intersection graphs of convex curves. This requires a little kind of uh, geometric manipulation, but you can get the same number two to the three quarters uh, times n squared divided by two. Uh, uh, I mean, asymptotically, the same number of intersection graphs of convex sets as intersection graphs of, of, uh, of streaks. Uh, but, but then there is a finer question. Uh, the finer question is that uh, perhaps every intersection graph of strings can be represented as intersection graphs of, uh, of uh, convex curves or convex sets. But, but this, uh, this is not the case. It's not... Uh, uh, very fine, very difficult to uh, disprove it, to come up with uh, with uh, intersection graphs of strings that cannot be represented by convex sets. I only mention uh, the tool which is used for that. The tool is uh, very nice and somewhat counterintuitive theorem of Kratochville and Matusek uh, proved more than 30 years ago. So uh, what they found was that there, there are string graphs, intersection graphs of curves in the plane and curves in the plane, so that uh, no matter how we represent them by strings, uh, how we find uh, curves whose intersection pattern is this, then there should be a huge number of intersection points between those curves, an exponential number of intersections, you know, of intersections. So we should always, so, so there, there is a graph which can be represented as an intersection graph of curves, but we can always find two out of those curves that intersect an exponent in an exponential number of points. Very, very nice construction. Now, okay, so now we know that there are more intersection graphs of strings than intersection graph of convex sets. But here comes uh, this uh, theorem uh, joined with Bruce Reed and Lena Yuditsky that nevertheless, almost all string graphs on n vertices are intersection graphs of convex sets. So I don't want to uh, uh, go into, uh, into that, uh, into the proof, but uh, uh, the proof is based uh, on um, uh, structure, uh, characterization of the structure of uh, almost every intersection graphs of, of strings. So it turns out that they, they have a pair-tight, multi-pair-tight uh, structure, actually four or to some extent five, uh, five uh, part-tight uh, structure. Almost every string graphs is a very uh, simple, District, uh, description. Okay, so uh, now I uh, come to the uh, last uh, topic that I like to uh, indicate. So, you know, as you notice, I, I don't, uh, I decided not to give any proofs, just uh, sort of indicate the ideas that are behind the statement. So we looked at uh, uh, string graphs, uh, 
uh, we, we looked at segment intersection graphs, string graphs, uh, uh, at most the intersecting strings, convex sets, and so on. So now we can fill out this table uh, and we see that uh, there is a two to the n log n, the order of magnitude is n log n for uh, semi algebraic. Uh, intersection graphs. This is the point that if you assume that the graphs are semi algebraic, then in any fixed dimension, the, the number of intersection graphs is roughly two to the n log n. And some special cases, like intersection graphs of unit disks and disks, they are semi algebraic. But in this ga these cases, we can also determine the constant. They were determined by McDiarmid and then and Müller, but more generally by uh, Lisa Sauerman. Then for strings, it comes out quadratic number, convex sets, the same number. But what happens if instead of segments, we consider pseudo segments? What are pseudo segments? It's interestingly, this, this notion comes up often comes up in computational geometry. So a si system of pseudo segments is a system of curves in the plane, uh, any two of which intersect in at most one point. And then the, the, uh, the, there is a very similar theorem of uh, Kratok, Wiel, and Matushek uh, from 1994, where they prove that there are intersection graphs of pseudo segments that cannot be represented by segments. That's very similar, uh, clever uh, construction. But then we may ask the same question as before that, okay, there are such uh, intersection graphs of pseudo segments. So there are graphs that can be represented as intersection graphs of, of arcs, any two of which intersect in one point, but not by segments. But is it true still that the vast majority of uh, pseudo segment intersection graphs can be represented by straight line segments? Just like before, we could prove that the vast majority of, uh, of uh, uh, intersection graphs of strings can be represented by intersection graphs of, by, by convex sets. It turns out that the answer is no. And the answer is no for a completely different simple reason that the number of pseudo segment intersection graphs is much, much larger than the number of segment intersection graphs. And this is uh, what uh, kind of proved in ongoing work, joint work with uh, Jacob Fox and, and uh, Andrew Soup. So uh, this I will be able to show in, in uh, uh, two minutes that uh, the number of pseudo segment intersection graphs when labeled vertices is two to the roughly n to the four third, which is much, much larger than the larger than the two to the n log n, the number of segment intersection graphs. Why? When you see this n to the four third, you should uh, what we think about uh, Uncle Paul, uh, who had uh, Paul Erdős, who had a, uh, a, a very simple but beautiful construction uh, where the end to the fourth third comes up uh, for a somewhat different problem. So, what was Erdős's construction? Forget about pseudo segment segment. So what Erdős constructed, he constructed n points of n points in the plane. Look at those blue points in the plane, n points, and n green lines, so that 
the number of incidences between them is roughly n to the fourth. So, so when is an incidence? An incidence is when a line passes through a point. So what was Erdős's construction? So look at the blue points. He put the blue points uh, in an array. So k is uh, n to the one third. So a k by k square n to the one third by n to the two thirds array of blue points. And then uh, he considered the straight lines, the equations are ax plus b, uh, so that these constants a and b uh, are integers, positive integers uh, smaller than n to the one third. Is n to the one third. So all, all of these, these are n lines and points, and it's very easy to compute that uh, the number of incidences between them is n to the fourth third. But now we would like to have uh, a uh, construction of pseudo segments, curves in the plane. So, how do we modify Erdős's construction? We look at those little blue points, integer points, and to each of them we extend with a little sh short purple horizontal segments. What do we do with the green lines? We, with the green lines, that's what we do. When I look at the green line, uh, uh, it would pass through this uh, blue point, then I actually avoid that blue point. I either avoid uh, along a circular arc above the blue point or along a circular arc below the blue point, and then I continue. So if I go above the blue point, then of course my green uh, line, pseudo segment, avoids the uh, purple segment. If I go below, then it will intersect it. This is a sigma, uh, system of uh, pseudo segments, uh, short segments and the, 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 the long uh, green pseudo segment. And for each incidence, I have two choices. Either they intersect or they don't intersect. So the total number of choices the total number of intersection graphs of, of these uh, pseudo segments is two to the, or sometimes n to the fourth. So in fact, uh, my pseudo segments are even, even x monotone. Now, uh, so I'd like to tell you, show you some uh, uh, positive results uh, without any proof. Uh, and at the end, I will kind of claim that uh, um, to some extent, this n to the fourth third uh, exponent is best possible. You will see in a second that in one sense, it's a little bit of a lie. Uh, okay, so uh, now we look at x monotone curves. We have uh, X monotone curves in the plane. I don't even assume that they are pseudo segments, so they can intersect in an arbitrary number of points. However, I only look at bipartite intersection patterns. So, n red curves and blue curves, they are X monotone. The total number of uh, uh, intersection patterns between them, well, it is closer to 2 to the n than uh, uh, 2 to the n to the fourth third or let alone 2 to the n square. Uh, at most, 2 to the n log square. Maybe one of these logs one can get rid of, uh, we were unable to. So as an immediate corollary of that is that, okay, not only bipartite intersection patterns, but if we know that the chromatic number of uh, those intersection graphs is, is small, high, then it will still be the same order of magnitude, except that we have to uh, multiply it by chi square. But if chi is small, then, then chi square is small. So it's just, just copy this theorem. Uh, 
and um, but we have an upper bound in certain cases for chi. And uh, this upper bound uh, follows from an old uh, theorem of not so old, eight years old theorem of mine with uh, uh, Jacob Fox. So uh, it says that the, if, if I look at any intersection graphs of strings, uh, if I have a bound on the clique number of the graphs, then I also have a bound on the chromatic number. So if I combine these uh, two theorems, that as long as the clique number is small, uh, I know that the total number of uh, uh, intersection graphs of X monotone curves is at most two to the N uh, to the one plus little of N. So <clears throat> uh, close to two to the N rather than two to the N squared. And uh, uh, here is uh, the, the last theorem I'd like to show you that uh, the number of n vertex uh, uh, intersection graph of, of X monotone pseudo segments with clique number omega is uh, at most two to the omega times n log square. N. So uh, I said that this to some extent, it shows that uh, the construction I showed you is optimal. In what sense does it show that? Well, in the sense that you remember that construction, uh, which I derived from Erdős's uh, incidence construction, the n to the fourth third construction. That's an intersection graph of pseudo segments. And if you check it, then the clique number in that construction is n to the one third. So, so actually, uh, with, with that restriction, uh, it follows from the uh, first theorem that, that uh, the four third bound, the n to the four third bound in the construction uh, is, is optimal. So I think that this is my, my time expired and this is a good point to stop at anyway. So I, I, I just, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and I very much hope that uh, next time uh, I can uh, be there uh, in person. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, and um... I think we can stop the recording and take questions. <laughs>